On the show today, I'm super excited to have the opportunity to be speaking with Aggie Dett. Originally from Birmingham, Alabama, Aggie Dett is a senior at NYU majoring in sports management with a concentration in organizational management and minoring in studio art with a concentration in painting. Aggie has a passion for sports and art and seeing the two worlds overlap. She has worked with some of the top sports brands in the world, including Formula E, FC Bayern Munich, and the Sydney Sixers. Aggie is also channeling her passion for sports into the arts and has started to commission drawings for people and organizations such as New Amsterdam FC, Passion FC, and the SPS Dovetail Magazine. Currently, she is working as the Director of Research and Engagement for Flint United and is the founder and host of the podcast, Adventures with Aggie. Aggie, it is so nice to have you here on the show today. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Lovely intro. Um, I'm super excited to dive into our conversation today. Yeah, I know we had um, to kind of reschedule a couple of times, but I'm so glad that we were finally able to find some time to speak today. Um, so for the audience's background, Aggie and I, like a lot of my guests, uh, we met as part of a fellow podcasters community and kind of scrolling through all these podcasters profiles. You know, I saw Aggie's profile and said, interest in sports and art. I was like, hmm. That's interesting. I don't see that very often. Like I, I myself am interested in sports and art. And when I looked at a little bit more into her background, I saw, you know, the cool sporting brands around the world she got to work with and her really cool drawings. Like it's amazing how detailed and how creative in nature you are, Aggie, with these drawings. I'm going to like on the YouTube version of this podcast, I'll put up like a picture, a couple of pictures of yours, um, and okay. of your drawings. So, um, it's just such an interesting topic. And the fact that you really like to see the two worlds mesh together and intersect was something that I, I think is not really appreciated as much as it should be. And there's so much to kind of learn from the sports and arts world and the intersection between the two. So today I'm really excited to be chatting with Aggie a little bit more about her background in sports and arts and how she's learned to connect with humans as a result of these two different worlds. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put it out there beforehand. I know I'm wearing a Lakers jersey as part of this podcast, but when, when I saw that you worked at FC Bayern Munich and that you uh, are a fan of Bayern Munich, I, I almost had to kind of resist. I was like, oh, because I'm an FC Barca fan. So uh, some past memories are definitely still haunting me. But nonetheless, I, I'm sure we're going to have a super fun conversation today. So before we go ahead and get on start, I'd love it, Aggie, if you can kind of share a little bit of your background into when you first got introduced to both the sports and arts worlds as a kid. Yeah, definitely. Um, so born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, I kind of played every sport growing up. Um, I tried it for a season. If I didn't like it, I would try something new. And um, my sports career, it kind of ended in high school when I permanently injured myself. Um, it, it's really not that exciting of a story. It wasn't like a crazy injury or anything, but, um, it's something that just wasn't going to get better. So I did everything. I was doing softball, cheerleading, dance. Uh, I tried volleyball. I broke my hand at tryouts. Like it was just those things where I just kept injuring myself over and over again. So I was like, okay, like I need to find something else. Um, so when I, I guess I started my sports probably when I was four or five doing soccer and I hated running. So that's the <laughs> next one. <laughs> um, so anyway, I worked all the way up to high school doing lots of sports. And then um, my injury came when I was a majorette. I was twirling batons and I permanently injured my feet. Um, I get lots of questions about that because like batons, you think hands and like mm -hmm. arms and stuff. But I did break my feet twirling batons, believe it or not. Um, so after that happened, I was like, okay, I still need something to channel my like competitive, like weird creative energy into. So mm -hmm. I kind of turned to music and the more artsy side of things. I still loved watching sports and I watched way too many sports, but I joined the show choir and I was dancing and singing. And then we had competitions every weekend. So I was still getting like that active or the active need that I needed through our dancing and our um, competitions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But then I was also kind of making this new, like artsy creative side of me that I didn't really know that, know that I had. Like um, I didn't start singing until high school. so. Um, I know this is about the art side of things, but I was singing and doing all of this kind of creative uh, activity. And then I was like, oh, wait, I can draw. I can paint. I didn't know that I could do these until mm -hmm. my athletic kind of career ended. Um, so I went to NYU, 
majored in sports. I love it. I'm almost done What I don't know, one more semester. So we're so close, but um, yeah, majoring in sports. And then I found out that I had the option to actually study art. Um, I never thought about studying it at a formal level. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, I think the past three years have really been where I realized I, I'm studying both of these things. How can I make those two the same? And mm-hmm. how can I work on both of those? Like, that's why I'm commissioning drawings for soccer teams. Like, I never thought I could do that in high school or anything when I started doing these two things separately. So I think the last year has really been the time where I'm like, okay, I can put these together and then see how they relate and how they make me feel and how they make other people feel. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I think that kind of answers your question, right? <laughs> no, no, definitely. No, that's such a cool story and how now you're able to kind of still, I think maybe you, you would say like sports was your first love and you're still able to kind of channel that passion and love for sports. And you found that through, um, maybe not the actual playing or execution of the sport right. itself, but now through a creative energy, through drawing and art. Um, so that's super cool, super cool. I- I'm curious to kind of learn a little bit more about, you know, during your time, you know, playing sports growing up and now uh, doing all these drawings and commissioning them for different sports brands. You know, what have you learned about yourself in terms of how you interact in, in team settings and organizational settings from both, you know, a sporting sense and an artistic sense? Yeah, I think um, one thing that sports and art has in common is like communication and connections. I know this is also your show is about relationships. So that's Mm -hmm. kind of, um, but yeah, I think like being able to communicate effectively is huge, obviously in sports. Like when you're calling a play, everybody has to know what's going on to make sure that it happens. Um, And then the same with art, like there's definitely, there's some kind of meaning behind that. And like, if you can effectively communicate that to everybody else, sees your piece or I don't know, you're walking through a museum and like you see the title and then you understand it. I think that's huge because then everybody's on the same page. Um, whether it's art or sports, communication is huge, hugely important, I think. Um, and then back to what I was saying about the meaningful connection kind of thing. I've never seen more passionate people in one place than when I'm sitting in a sporting arena, regardless of the sport. Usually the people that are super into it and super excited. Right. And you kind of get that same thing in the arts world, I think. Like, you go to any kind of art gallery, the Met, or there's a reason why the Met's so famous, right? Like everybody loves to go there. Everybody loves to see all of the wonderful art, whether it's from last year or 800 years ago. And there's all yeah. of this connection, whether it's between the people or the people in the art, which I can also go into this whole rant on how sport is art, which is kind of what I love about the sports world. Um, but yeah, I think it's like connections and communication is kind of where I see the overlap in the two. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think, you know, for any of us that grew up playing sports, imagine we, we, we cut off that communication, that connection of, okay, I'm on a soccer field running. My mouth is shut. You can't hear me, <laughs> but still the connection yeah. comes as a real, I can look at someone and then you can maybe still form some kind of communication. So that's such a true statement and same thing with the art. If I don't see, you know, the, the title of the, of the artwork or, you know, there, there's always a message that the art in and of itself has, and it's yeah. always going to vary from person to person what that meaning is. But regardless, like you were mentioning, it's this passion, this, there's this, there's this emotion. I can't even describe it, but it's so ethereal that when it comes to both the sports and arts world that I'm curious to learn, you know, now that you've kind of worked your way into sports management. So looking a little bit more from the business aspect of sports, how have you been able to kind of manage those two conflicting types of messaging in the sense that there's that emotional aspect of both sport and art, but now there's a more practical way of communicating. I'm curious to learn how you've gone about trying to balance those two different conflicting uh, ideals when it comes to, you know, connection and sport in the sports and arts world. Yeah. Um, I don't think I realized the connection in the art world until like much later than in the sports world. Cause like I said, I started playing sports when I was a little girl. And I definitely felt like the emotion, whether it's to the Alabama football team or FC Bayern, like I had my emotional connection to Mm -hmm. whatever team was on the TV. Even if I hated both teams, I might hate one less. And so I would cheer for them. But there was always that emotional side um, and to why I liked the teams that I liked. But when it came to art, I don't think I had that appreciation or connection with those pieces until I took an art class when I was studying abroad in London in 2018. And like London... obviously the history is a lot older than here in the U S and when you, when I was going into these museums, these galleries with my class and my professors, 
I just, I couldn't wrap my head around what it took to create these pieces of art, whether it was in year like 800, like that seems so long ago. Like (laughs) how did they make that then? You know, Mm -hmm. um, it, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love this. And then I realized I could also do it, which is really cool. And then maybe like a thousand years from now, somebody will find one of my illustrations of whatever and think about the same thing that I thought when I saw like a bust of Julius Caesar's head in the British Museum. Like Mm -hmm. that's crazy. Um, so yeah, those, those like connections and like the emotion that I was feeling, I don't think it was the same because I can't say my body felt the same when I was watching Alabama score a touchdown versus seeing Julius Caesar in the British Museum, you know, like that's just not the same emotion, Right, right. but I definitely had this like, wow, that's really cool. You know, Mm. um, I guess, wow, that's really cool is definitely like simplifying what I was feeling. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah. And now I think like seeing those two. And like, I didn't realize putting them together until I did it myself. Like I was saying earlier, like I started drawing pictures of soccer players or I started, I don't know, painting pictures of whatever it is, a soccer ball or something like that. Um, but now it's even more so where I see sport as art, like mm-hmm. I don't, the crazy grand slam you see, like Aaron judge hits a grand slam. You're not going to tell, like, you can't tell me that's not beautiful, you know, in some way, like there's mm-hmm. an art and technique that goes into that. Um, yeah. So I think that's kind of how they came together, even though they were super separate at first, um, the last few years, definitely like during my time at NYU and maybe that's like the NYU philosophical thing that they always push onto us and thinking about how like sport isn't just sports, sport is everything. It's humanity and things like that. Um, yeah. So I think that's kind of where it came from. Interesting. Interesting. So, So have you found that I always sense that when you're in the business aspect of things that over the years, like at first, because you were so, it, it's almost like you're, you're innocent in the sense that that emotion is what really drives you towards those world. But once you kind of start seeing a little bit more of the organizational or business aspect of the world, it really starts to eat away and chip away at that yeah. emotional interest that you first got inspired by in the sports and arts world. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, you having been able to work with so many different organizations has, have you found that to be Uh, the case that you've experienced yourself or how have you been able to, as a result, keep that flame, keep that fire and passion for sports and art, you know, still burning with the idea of, you know, those, those pressures and those like deadlines, whatever you want to think about when it comes to the business and organizational management world, kind of casting a shadow over your passion. Yeah. Um, I think during my first probably two years of studying the sports business, I watched significantly less sports than I ever had in my life. Um, I don't, it wasn't like burnout. Burnout's not really the right word. That's very extreme. But like after sitting in a classroom for six hours that day, learning about the business that goes on behind putting on a Knicks game at Madison Square Garden, I had no desire to turn on the NBA that night. I was just, I was learning about it all day. And then like to a certain extent, it dehumanizes the sport. So like I read this entire book on the operations of an arena. And I was like, okay, now I can't even watch the Yankees play without thinking about all of the people that are working, the the hundreds of thousands of people that it took to put on the game. So in a Mm -hmm. sense, I'm not going to say it's distracting, but it's distracting. You know, like I think about all of the people that it took to uh, cut the grass rather than him actually hitting the ball over the field. You know, it's a big difference um, in knowing everything that goes on in the business rather than just the, the guys warming up in the bullpen and he's going to hit it's, there's so many more elements to it than people think. And I think that's kind of what changed sports. I still watch a lot of sports and like probably way more than regular people, but those like first two years when I was studying the business, I was like, okay, like I'm done. Like, I don't, I don't need to see anybody Mm -hmm. play today. Um, it was just thinking about it all the time. And I was like, okay, like it's not as like, oh my gosh, like it's happening tonight. You know, the game's on like, okay, I've been thinking about the game for three weeks in my class. Um, But I think from the art side, it was different because like art, in a sense, like drawing, painting, all of that kind of stuff is more new to me, I think. So I was going out there and I was researching like, uh, there's a bunch of like super famous painters that paint only the University of Alabama football. Like that's it. And they're well known for that. And so I was looking into these artists and I was like, oh my gosh, like that's so amazing. I want to do something like that. But I mean, they've been doing it for so long. I don't see myself doing that anytime soon, but (laughs) 
I think I just had this like new fire for like, oh my gosh, I want to see these two things overlap and how I can get into it because it was a little bit more new um, rather than like me. I wasn't painting from the age of like three. Um, I could have been, I think that would have been really cool. And who knows where I would be right now. But <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was just kind of a, a little bit of, okay, it's another baseball game. I know I've seen this like, but now, I mean, I'm still watching so many more sports and like, when the bubble was happening or like before COVID, when everything was shut down, I was craving it. Like I definitely wanted it, but there's just a little bit more fire. I think for the art side, just trying to see how two things that overlap overlap because people don't think about it. Like you were saying before. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm the first person at NYU to major in sports and minor in art. Okay. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> um, I had to go through so many approvals to get that done. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I can't believe that's really never been done before. Um, so I think that says enough and like people don't think about this overlap at all um, or not as much as they should. Right. Yeah, that's actually super interesting because I think. There's such a huge overlap between the two that everyone is aware of, but maybe it's just there's not enough interest in seeing both of them overlap. I don't know why that's the case. Um, so one of the things that I'm also curious about is like when you started or when you stopped watching sport as much, you know, how did you able to, how were you able to finally start kind of watching sport again or getting that passion back? Like one of the things I think of is sometimes, you know, even for me personally, like sport eventually kind of lost its luster, but sometimes when I would like see the field, the pitch, the, you know, the mound, you know, just seeing how well, you know, maintained it was or how freshly cut it was that in of itself, like, you know, the groundsmen, they would always do such an impeccable job of keeping the stadium, you know, in tip top shape. And that was kind of an art form in of itself. Like it, it was almost as, as interest as more as interesting as the actual sporting event itself. Yeah. So I'm curious if that was kind of something or if there's anything else like along those lines of bringing that artistic kind of newfound sense and passion that you found into the sports world again to kind of reignite that interest in sport. Yeah. Um, uh, no, yeah, I think I agree with everything you just said. Um, watching, I, one of the things that was absolutely insane to me was when we were watching, um, I think it was my sophomore year. So like two years into this, like, oh my gosh, more sports situation. Um, we were watching Madison square garden flip from a Rangers, like a Rangers setup, like hockey arena mm -hmm. into a basketball arena. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is crazy because you're watching like these couple hundred people like remove ice or cover up ice and turn it into a basketball court. Like that was insane. And I was like, Oh my gosh, there's so many more people that go into putting on these events that we don't think about. And like, to a sense, it is an art. Like people say sometimes like, Oh, sports and art because of the form that it takes, like a baseball pitcher's form. Like that is an art. Like, yes. But also like this whole, like, I don't know how to say it. Like the show that they put on, like yep. not just a basketball game. There's like dancers and cheerleaders and people shooting t-shirts and like some kind of large animal mascot situation running around the, like the court. It's mm -hmm. so much more than just LeBron shooting threes all night, you know, mm -hmm. like it's, it's so much. And I think after I kind of was like, oh my gosh, like another basketball game, I was like, oh, it's not just another basketball game. It's like all these thousands of people putting on this crazy show for regular fans like me to go sit and enjoy. And like, um, and another part kind of. I guess, I guess it's related, but maybe not really, but, um, it's like the unpredictability of sport. Yeah, like yeah. people always say it's hard to make a business around something that's unpredictable, but then you look at the sports industry and it's like, Oh, like you can do it. You know, sports is completely unpredictable. You never know who's going to win, who's going to get hurt, who's going to kill it that night. But all of that goes into this show that people are putting on, right. And how people can mm -hmm. change whatever they're doing or whatever they're thinking on their toes, because who knows who, who's putting together that highlight video that you watch during halftime, you know, mm -hmm. video is art. It's the same thing as sports. So essentially it's all art in the end, but I think people disagree with me about some of this. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's all art in the end. No. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with that point. And I think, yeah, like that point you were mentioning with like video being art. Yeah. Like imagine if we weren't able to see these highlight reels and that's kind of yeah. where the emotional passion and interest comes from sport and that in of itself is an art like it like i've done video editing like you've done all this artistic work like it, it's not easy to actually create the storyline that goes into it like when you hear also the storylines like when espn is creating these stories it's not just coming out of thin air like they have to somehow combine some sort of like narrative that will get like the interest of the audience which in of itself 
sure it's derived from sport and what like the facts are, but there are like nuances that is the artistic side of it, which is, I think, super underrated or not as well. People are not as aware of it or as interested in it. So I I definitely agree with your viewpoint there. And I think that a lot of people, they they would find a, a newfound appreciation, I think, for all the people that go on in the background in sporting events and you know the art world fuels the sports world that's how like we get to watch sports and get so interested because i think if we really stripped away all of those people we i I have a sense that we would not be as interested in sport anymore for some reason like think about if you watch a sunday pickup game imagine you watching that every single weekend would you be as interested in it (laughs) i don't necessarily know maybe i could be wrong i could be wrong but that's just my (laughs) personal take so, so I'm, I'm kind of curious, you've alluded to this already th- throughout this episode, but like, what are some of the co- uncommon themes or um, overlapping ideas between the sports and arts world that you think can really help people foster better human connections in their livelihoods, in regardless of whatever area in life that it is that they want to create these connections in? Yeah, I, when you sent me this question, I had no idea which way to take it. So I've been mm-hmm. thinking about this one a lot. Um, Especially, I, I think I'm going to go like down the, the power of sport and like the power of art, like that mm-hmm. kind of route um, and how it brings so many people together. Sorry, they bring so many people together, like sports and art. Like mm-hmm. I was already talking about like people who hundreds of thousands of people who come into an arena and watch whatever game is on that night and the same amount of people going to the Met that weekend. Um, so I think it's the power of these two things is underrated, but also everybody, regardless of background, race, religion, whatever it is, whatever kind of person you are, you probably have some kind of appreciation for some form of art or some sports team, or you might not appreciate sports, but you watch sports for whatever reason. Your dad makes you watch sports. So your dad's always watching whatever on TV. Um, So I think like that kind of goes into my experience, at least, is learning how to work with people that you don't necessarily have the same opinions with, or you don't agree with all the time. Um, because art, like we know there are some very controversial artists out there. They, whether it's about their politics or their background or whatever they want to create in their pieces of art, they can express their feelings, emotion, and ideas through these pieces. And I think sports, we've seen that happen this year. They have a, or they, I'm specifically speaking about NBA right now, but they Mm -hmm. have a huge platform. They can show whatever kind of emotion, belief, or their stance or whatever they're backing. They can be behind this. And lots of people get around it. They want to understand it because of this. um, I guess it's their power, which I've already said, but like the power of sport and the power of art. You can put so much into both of these things that someone's going to listen. Someone's going to look at it. Someone's going to follow you. Someone's going to do something. But they're all from different backgrounds. Like I'm some girl from Alabama and like, I love watching the Lakers and I love seeing what NBA is doing this week, you know, but the same thing goes for, I follow these art pages on Instagram. Like I want to see these up and coming artists and what's making them so unique. Um, I think it's about like people following because of like the, the expression side of art and sport Um, and working with people that you don't agree with, or you don't, you might not agree with, or you don't understand, but art and sport might allow you to do that. yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. No, no, but. that definitely makes sense. I, I think like the, the the best example you can think of is like take for instance when you're at a sporting arena or you're in you know an art gallery, you can look to the left and right of you, and there's going to be someone from a completely different background from you, and right. you don't know anything about you know their beliefs, their upbringing. But when you are watching you know a sporting event or you're looking at a piece of art, you can like strike up that conversation and create that connection. Yeah. And it brings people together regardless of your background. I think as cliche as that is, that is what sport and art does. And as a result, when you can kind of create, they, they, as a result, create this community of people that follow that platform, follow that power that they do yeah. carry in those creative expressions and art and the actual um, I, creative and execution aspects of sports. Yeah. Like you were mentioning, I think it's, a, it's an art as well, but you know, when people can follow that and then they can rally around the messages that they're able to kind of transmit through the creative art piece or the actual sporting event, it can kind of, it has a lot of power in shaping and transforming the ideas that people and people's beliefs 
and that they can yeah. rally around certain ideas. I don't want to necessarily say universal ideas because I think everyone still has the power to make their own choices in terms of their beliefs, but it does have a lot of weight and power that that there's just it's it's just, it's inexplicable really it's really inexplicable yeah. i don't even know um <laughs> like i'm just at a loss for words right now even trying to think about what to say um yeah I definitely say- i think the sorry to interrupt you i think mm-hmm. one of the craziest experiences i had was i was at a museum in london and there was it was a world war ii museum i think and there were lots of paintings like about the war and like these artists that were putting together pieces of whether it was sculptures or paintings or drawings or whatever, but there were also pieces of the war within the museums. There were boats and there were airplanes and there were bombs. And I was standing in front of this, it sounds very odd when I'm explaining it, but I was standing like in a room and there was a bomb like located on the floor and there was a painting above it. And there was this ancient old man there. And I was just standing there reading the plaque, like trying to understand what was happening. And he looked at me and he said, I know exactly where I was when this bomb was dropped on my town. And he was like pointing at the painting, like showing me like I was in this area, like it was of his town. And I was like, oh my gosh, like that's like history and art. But I mean, I don't think sports really came into play there. But still like that experience that I felt like just, I was just standing next to this man. I had no idea that he had any idea to speak to me that day or like just that experience of not having absolutely no idea that he was that this piece of art, not the bomb, but the actual art and mm-hmm. the bomb, I guess, really affected his life and how now that affected me. Like, I will remember that moment forever. Like, I just thought he was some nice old man enjoying the history museum. Mm-hmm. But no, he went there because that was his life. Like that his background was essentially on display in that museum and he was going to see it, which is so cool. Um, sorry, that was a little bit of a, a tangent story. But no, I think, no. I don't know, I think it relates just because the his experience and his background directly affected me. And I wasn't trying to get that that day, you know, like I wasn't going like, oh, I'm going to meet an old man today and he's going to tell me about the war, you know, like the same thing goes for any kind of sporting event. Like you were saying, you can sit next to somebody, you have no idea where they're from or what they've done. Um, Yeah. So I think that's kind of an example of what I was trying to say earlier. (laughs) No, 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 definitely. I think (laughs) it's really inexplicable. I think it's just, it's just the emotion that's encapsulated in that moment. Like you were mentioning when you're talking to that old man and he recounts his history of like when he was, you know, going through the war and that's kind of where he grew up. It's so hard to kind of put it into words. It's just like you were saying that feeling, like you will never forget that feeling for the rest of your life. And same thing in a, in a sporting event, like there's those artistic moments in sports that you will never forget. You're like, I knew exactly where I was that day, what I was wearing, how I was feeling. I can somewhat explain it, but the actual feeling of what, of what was going on inside me, it's inexplicable. And I think that's the true power and just pull of sports and arts that I think I hope people can really start to appreciate a little bit more. And I'm glad there's people like you who are really kind of pushing the boundaries of trying to find the intersection between the two. And, you know, I can't wait to see what you keep on doing within the artistic world. And, you know, maybe you want to transition over to like uh, another uh, soccer club. You know, we got we got some troubles going on at Barca, so maybe you can do some organizational management there. But nonetheless, I know you're going to keep doing some great work in um, both the sporting and arts world. So what I what I like to do at the end of each of my episodes with my guests is uh, go through this final segment I call the three keys to relationships. So this is a segment where I ask guests three questions to kind of gain insight into their own philosophy on relationship management. And so these questions pertain to any and all relationships. So social relationships with friends, family, romantic partners, in business setting, any and all relationships. And I also, these aren't quick fire questions. So I'd love to hear you elaborate on these, on these questions. So the first question I have is, um, what's your number one relationship red flag? Yeah, I think um, this my answer kind of relates to what I was talking about at the beginning of the show is um, I think the red flag is lack of communication. Like I can't stand it, whether it is like all of the examples that you provided friends, family, business, whatever. um, I can't stand it when either people aren't communicating properly, like they're not telling me exactly what they want, exactly what they feel or whatever it may be. But I also don't like when things just appear out of the blue, like 
um, I wasn't aware that something was going on within my team and then they tried to execute it and I was never a part of it. And then I'm expected to fulfill some kind of role. Like I hate either the lack of communication or like just leaving people out of the loop. Um, I guess it's more so for the team setting, but, um, yeah, the communication is so important in all aspects of life, like friends, family work, um, especially in sports. I think it's huge on the field, off the field, in the office, whatever. Um, I, speaking to people and making sure that everybody is on the same page about whatever topic it is, um, either like what's for dinner tonight or what play you're going to call like on the football field. It's hugely important, I think. Um, and I also really like speaking. Obviously, I like talking and I like understanding people. So I want to know like where they're coming from, why they're deciding to do this and what they, what it is they're trying to do. Like, um, I mean, that's also like, I have a podcast and I kind of talk about that, like the stories behind people and what they're doing. So I want to understand how they're communicating these things. Um, yeah. So long story short, communication is, uh, or lack of communication is the red flag. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, I, I think this time that we're going through right now is kind of really bringing to life, you know, that idea of communicating more openly and more honestly. I think there's been a lot of things that are kind of pushed under the rug and those are kind of coming up to a boil right now. And I think like you were mentioning, if you were able to kind of hash that out, whether it's a tough conversation or it's something as simple as, you know, when are you going to send, you know, this, this envelope to X person, you know, that information when it's withheld, it can snowball into such a huge issue that really could have been easily avoided. And it was something just so simple, so simple. Right. So like you were mentioning, I think this time is really going to bring to life uh, that point in both your personal circles and your, um, your more business related circles. So, you know, I hope that people really take away that they got to do a better job at communication and just, you know, your life just becomes so much better when you're able to communicate openly with others. Mm -hmm. So the second question I have is kind of a converse of that. What's the number one underrated relationship quality in your opinion? Yeah. Um, I think I'll do one for like friends and one for like, team teams, I guess, professional mm -hmm. teams and stuff. But I think for my friends and my family, it's, I don't know, there's not really a word for it. Or if there is like, please let me know. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I think it's like that feeling when like, you don't see someone for a really long time. But then like, when you're, you're speaking to them, or you're seeing them again, it feels like you never lost touch. And like, you never, mm -hmm. um, you never really had that gap or whatever happened. I don't know what that word is. There's probably some like philosophical science word for that, but like, mm -hmm. it's so exciting, you know, like I don't see like, I don't know, not my cousins, but like my friends or something from high school. Like I live in New York. I don't see them, but maybe once a year now. And like, it feels like we never lost touch and we talk to each right. other every day, even though we're like, Oh, this happened to me six months ago. Like regardless of what we're talking about, it still feels like I see them every day and I talk to them every day. And maybe that's just like a genuine friendship. And that's what that is, or the excitement of seeing them again. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think the most underrated thing is like having that connection with someone where you don't feel like you've lost them for however long you did. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know if that's a good answer because it's not a quality. It's kind of a thing, I guess, whatever happens. Um, and then I think like for teams, like in a professional setting, it's having like that balance of work, but also like understanding the people you're working with, like not on like a super personal level, because that gets like really weird if you go like too deep into those sometimes, <laughs> but, um, like understanding the team, the job that is like the tasks that you're required to do, but also understanding each person and how they're going to do those. Well, um, like if you have a bunch of introverts and a bunch of extroverts, you have to learn how to like work with them appropriately in order to get the job done. Um, you can't just go into a room with a bunch of introverts and expect them to start speaking and like super excited, throwing out ideas and things. Mm -hmm. That's not how they communicate sometimes. So yeah, I think it's just understanding what the job is to be done and how the people on the team are going to effectively do that. Um, yeah, those are very different answers for friends and teams and I'm sure they can go both ways, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's, it's kind of what I think about underrated qualities. No. Yeah, definitely. I think on the, on the more social aspect of, you know, being able to kind of speak with people now, kind of everyone being all across the world and, you know, messaging people through messaging platforms. And then when you get to see them, you know, through FaceTime or you get to actually visit them in person, like, it's like, you've never missed a beat though. Yeah. I, I don't even know what the word is for that either, but it's really, it's really, those are the, 
true types of relationships that you can like hark back onto. And those are the ones that carry you through life for years on end. And it's just, Mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain it either, like you were mentioning, but those are the types of relationships that really go under the radar, I think. And we just start to take them for granted in in a sense. So I completely agree with that point. And, And the other one with like, in a more organizational setting. I think you, I listened to one of your podcasters and I forgot who it was, but it was someone who was at PSG who was both in the management position and a, yeah. and a goalkeeper. And she, you were mentioned, mm-hmm. she was kind of mentioning how when you're in management, you have like certain things you have to get done from a job duties perspective. But right. then when you're a player, you understand, I think she, she was mentioning something about like, you can't wear this because like she was in branding, but yeah. at the same time she understood as a player, like I can't really just say this to, you know, her, like I'm a player <laughs> yeah. as well. So um, if you want to learn more about that, then you should actually go listen to that, that episode of Aggies. Um, it's a really interesting take when you're both in the front office and you're a player and just under trying yeah. to understand the more kind of on paper job duties, responsibility versus mm-hmm. kind of the more, soft skills, understanding people and understanding how can I mesh these two so that it works for both parties at hand. So really yeah. interesting, really interesting episode. And I think, you know, Aggie had a really great conversation with that individual. Yeah, that was really fun. I was speaking, um, I think you're referring to Ariana Cristione. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, she's a goalkeeper for PSG now. And I think another part of this that um, she kind of touched on, but I think I was thinking about more so afterwards was how you separate your love or like fan fan mindset for a team in the business setting. She's a player, which is different. But if I were working for PSG men or women, I think I would also kind of have some kind of fan, like Mm -hmm. fan mindset, like, Oh, I love the team. Or like if I was working for, uh, I was going to say the New York Knicks, they're not really killing it right now, but I'm still (laughs) a diehard Knicks fan. If I was working for them, I know that I would have to separate the fan mindset with the business mindset. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not doing this because I like the players. I'm doing this because this is best for the business, right? Uh, which is also, I don't know, it's kind of the same thing, but we talked about that a little bit too with Ariana. And I think she does a really good job of separating that business, uh, the business decision-making with her, like a bias of being a player on the team she's working mm-hmm. for. Um, yeah, it was a really great episode. Yeah. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you know, I don't think a lot of people have that kind of perspective. Like Aggie has that perspective. You can listen to that episode. Uh, on Aggie's podcast, kind of, if you're interested in both getting into the front office of sport of the sporting organizations and also our fan and having to kind of distinguish and delineate that line that you have to kind of really walk a very fine line on. And so the last question I have, Aggie, is uh, what would be your own mantra or slogan for relationship management? So I can give a little bit of context. This podcast, it centers itself around the idea that we don't make relationships but we make relationships better. So I'm kind of curious to know what, what would be your own mantra slogan? Yeah. Um, I think my life, like my life slogan that I think about like every single day, partly because it's on my wall in my room, but also just because it's been my thing my whole life is do what you love and love what you do. Um, I think that applies to like business and personal things. Um, Mm -hmm. if you don't like your job, then you're not going to like your job and you're not going to have a good time doing it. Um, if you don't like the people you're around, you're not going to have fun with the people you're around. Like it's the same thing. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, one thing that I think about a lot is just being super passionate about all the projects and jobs and friends and whatever it is I'm channeling my energy into. I want to make sure I love what I'm doing. Um, and then I think one for relationship management, super cliche, but this was my first thought when I read this question was teamwork makes the dream work. If you're not a team with whoever it is you're working with or you're dating or your family or whoever it is, it's not going it, to, whatever it is that you're working towards, it's not going to work out near as easily as if you were working as a team, or like a functioning partner or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I think they're, they're similar. They're related with like being super passionate about what you're doing, but also like actually having the team to make sure that you can get to where you want to go. Um, yeah. So I know they're both kind of cliche. Actually, teamwork makes the dream work is probably the most cliche, but uh, <laughs> yeah, do what you love and love what you do. Those are kind of my things. No, I completely agree. And I think just keeping it simple, even if you hark back onto those cliches, they are so as you, at least for me, as I've gotten older, I just started to kind of really resonate a little bit more with the cliche statements because yeah. you start to see 
it's a re- there's a reason why it's cliche. There's a reason why people are like, oh, but in reality, yeah, when you can find that teamwork makes the dream work and you see that those types of team settings that you're able to kind of create and foster in your personal life with, you know, friends, family, romantic partners are in kind of a more business setting with, you know, your colleagues. It really does elevate the experience and make it that much more worthwhile in terms of the goal that you guys are working towards, whatever that may be and whatever context you're working in. And so, so yeah, I think, and, and with sports, sports and arts, you know, th- these two worlds really foster those teamwork elements in terms of learning how to be a good teammate, learning how to communicate, learning how to be an effective leader, learning how to create stories that everyone can rally around. So I think, you know, everyone should, everyone do- I think everyone does go through a time when they're a kid, when they are like an artist or, you know, a sports figure and that they can learn all these skills. But I think there, there's a really, there's a lot of power in kind of keeping up with either of these two worlds and even more power, like to you, Aggie, when you're intersecting between both of the worlds together. So, you know, this has been such a great conversation. Aggie, I really enjoyed learning more about your background and um, learning more about the sports and arts world. Like I, there's so much that goes on in the background that I'm sure we didn't even, you know, touch on. And that, you know, I'm interested in learning more about, I hope that the audience is also kind of, kind of don't lose your passion for sports. I have a feeling that that might come across in this episode, but no, trust me, Aggie and I, we're both watching, we're both still (laughs) avid sports fans. So don't let this turn you off. If it did, I'm, I I was a bad host in this episode, but you know, maybe, maybe you can be like Aggie and, you know, channel your passion into (laughs) arts and learn a little bit more about the arts world if you aren't um, as in tune with that world but you know this has been such a great episode aggie and you know i hope that you you go do great things you know both in the front office of different managed different sporting organizations and commissioning more art and you know i'm looking forward to you know your podcast going for i i can't wait to see some 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 pretty cool interviews i know you've interviewed some pretty cool guests already but i I, i'm particularly looking forward to see if you can get like a neymar or someone on on your podcast (laughs) at some point in the future one day (laughs) one day so i I, i'm going to be rooting for that episode and i know you're going to be working your way maybe maybe in the psg front office you'll just be in the front (laughs) office and it'll be kind of a day-to-day hey what's up neymar and and, and mbappe and all of them but you know this has been absolutely wonderful aggie and i and yeah i just wanted to let leave some time for you if you wanted to leave any lasting messages yeah no this has been awesome thank you so much for inviting me on I was really excited when you sent me that initial email or message or whatever it was, um, because I'd never been asked to speak about this. And it was kind of weird because it's like my thing, you know, like this is mm-hmm. what I do, uh, whether it's sports and art or both um, at the same time. But yeah, no, I don't mean to discourage people from watching sports. <laughs> I just think it. <laughs> I love sports. Obviously, I was watching the. I love the Detroit Lions. I was watching them before this. I think they were down by like maybe 40 something points, but like it doesn't matter who the team is, who's on the field. It's still fun to watch sports. Um, But yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Hey everyone, my name is Shaman Raman, and thanks for tuning in to my YouTube channel today. I hope you found this episode of the Between Us podcast enjoyable and that you're walking away feeling entertained, inspired, and or motivated. If you particularly enjoyed this episode, please go ahead and smash the like button down below and leave your thoughts in the comments section. And if you'd like to go ahead and keep up with the podcast, go ahead and follow our social media. And please go ahead and subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell. So that way you can find out about new episodes as soon as they're released. Until next time, everyone, take care. And we'll see you all in the next episode.